Esther Phillips, Dr. Natasha Laming Lee, Professor Laming's daughter, his granddaughter Tanya and her husband Mark, and his great granddaughter Marley. What a distinguished name. Members of the UE community, including alumni, retirees, and students, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, friends, all, good evening. Uh, my name is Tennyson Joseph, and it is my distinct pleasure and honor to have been invited to chair tonight's seventh annual George Laming Distinguished Lecture that is put on by the Errol Barrow Center for Creative Imagination. The Errol Barrow Center is very keen in playing its role as an arm of the university to maintain the name of George Laming, to recognize his achievements, to celebrate his work as a poet, novelist, essayist, orator, a permanent educator, editor, activist, a mentor to many, distinguished intellectual, pioneer of the West Indies literary tradition. And, and for this reason, the Pedagogical Center here has been named after George Laming, and the, the, the distinguished George Laming lecture is yet one other way in which the Earl Barrow Center is continuing with its project of honoring George Laming. Tonight is a special occasion because on Thursday the 8th, Professor Laming celebrated his 90th birthday, and I would want us all to give him a resounding round of applause. We are honored by his presence, and we are grateful that he is with us tonight, eternally grateful. But to formally welcome you to the Earl Barrow Center, I would like to call to the podium Mrs. Carla Springer Hunt, who is deputizing for Dr. Jennifer Obida, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, who cannot be with us tonight, and she has asked Carla to carry the torch on her behalf. So I invite Carla to the podium. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Senate, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Professor Clive Landis, Dr. Tennyson Joseph, Professor Lamin, a distinguished member of the Cave Hill family, the university family, deans, deputy deans, and heads of department, family and friends of Professor Lamin, members of the UE community, including all of our alumni, retirees, and our students, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am delivering remarks written by Professor Obida, Dean Obida. Um, only at five o'clock, I think it was, she called and said that she would not be able to make it. She's very unwell. Um, so I am going to do justice to her words. Good evening. I am saddened that I am unable to deliver these brief remarks in person due to illness, and I thank Mrs. Carla Springer Hunt for delivering them on my behalf. I completed the first half of my fifth form in Barbados, and I never learned about the works of George Lamin. I was introduced to his finest work in the castle of my skin in a literature classroom at Yale University. As an overwhelmed, though eager student completing a master's degree in African American literature, when I read the In the Castle of My Skin as a course assignment, it was refreshing to connect with my Barbadian roots in a classroom of students, many of whom did not look like me, and of those who looked like me, none were of Caribbean heritage. It was also very gratifying that recognition of George Lamin's role as a leading Caribbean novelist and poet was evidenced by the mere fact that his work remained a critical staple in the literature classrooms of such a distinguished university. So as we celebrate the life, 
happy birthday to a fellow Gemini, Sir George, and work of this distinguished literary artist, those of us who are scholars of literature at the University of the West Indies must ponder our own roles in maintaining the legacy of our literary greats. We too should aspire not only to teach our work to our students, but to produce such works that compel the spotlight on the center stage of academe globally. Our distinguished guest lecturer, our very own Vice Chancellor, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, has made a modern day mark on the canon of Caribbean history, carrying on the legacy of renowned historians who came before him. So too should the work of contemporary Caribbean literary scholars from the University of the West Indies continue to reverberate in and expand the literary canons. We are assured that the intellect, artistry, and creativity have been here long, all along, but as we salute one of our legends this evening, I thank you for coming, and I invite you to enjoy the intellectual stimulation in which, no doubt, you will be engaged in this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Uh, this year uh, being a very, very special year, as we mark Professor Lamming's 90th birthday, it was felt fitting that we have a very, very special guest lecturer, one who has a special connection to Professor Lamming, one who counts Professor Lamming among his mentors, and one who no doubt has been shaped intellectually, ideologically, and politically by Professor Lamming. I'm speaking, of course, of none other than the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, our university, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. Even more special in my view is the fact that Professor Beckles promises to speak to us on a very critical topic that has been central to his research over the years. If before coming here tonight, you did not know what it was meant by the phrase to take the gloves off, then after reading his title, you'll be very clear of the meaning of that phrase. Britain's perfect Caribbean crime ignored genocide, fake emancipation, insincere independence, and no reparations. The professor seems to be very angry tonight. And for this reason, I am pleased that I am not the one who is tasked with introducing the angry professor. That, that task has fallen on our deputy principal, Professor Clyde, Clive Landis, who will be tasked with that responsibility of introducing Professor Hillary and hope, hoping that he may soothe him in the process of doing so. Professor Landis. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Senate, Professor Sir Hillary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Mrs. Carla Springer Hunt, manager of the Errol Barris Center for the Creative Imagination, Dr. Tennyson Joseph, head of the Department of Government, Sociology, and Social Work Faculty of Social Sciences, Deputy Deans, Deans, and Heads of Department, Professor George Lemming, and four generations of his family. Members of the UE community, including alumni, retirees, and students, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. I have been given the task of introducing tonight's featured speaker, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Distinguished Professor of Economic and Social History, Administrator, Internationally Renowned Historian and Expert Strategist. This task, I soon came to realize, was not going to be an easy one, at least not in the brief period of time I have been allotted. But since I'm not one to shy away from a challenge, let me push on. Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, before assuming the office of the Vice Chancellor, served as the Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the Cave Hill Campus for 13 years, from 2002 to 2015. Sir Hilary's academic journey began when he graduated in 1976 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economic and Social History from Hull University in the UK and a PhD from the same university in 1980. 
His extraordinary research accomplishments saw him ascend to the highest echelons of academia when at the age of 36, he became the University of the West Indies' youngest scholar to be promoted to a personal chair, professor of economic and social history. He was also the recipient of the first Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence for his contributions in the field of research. So Hillary's achievements are not limited to the Caribbean. He has achieved global recognition through service on a number of United Nations committees and advisory panels, and is most notably a founding member of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's Science Advisory Board on Sustainable Development. He has also acted as advisor to UNESCO's Cities for Peace Global Program. Among his other achievements at the international level, Sir Hillary has served as an advisor to the UN World Culture Report and is the vice president of UNESCO's General History of Africa series. In 2015, he was invited by the president of the United Nations General Assembly to deliver the feature address during the sitting at which the decade from 2015 to 2024 was declared the UN Decade for African Descendant People. Sir Hillary has lectured extensively in Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Asia, and has published over 100 peer-reviewed essays and 14 scholarly books and monographs on subjects ranging from Atlantic and Caribbean history, gender relations in the Caribbean, sport development, and popular culture. He has also received several awards internationally, including the degree of Honorary Doctor of Letters from Brock University in Canada, the University of Glasgow in Scotland, his alma mater Hull University in England, the Kwame Nkrumah University for Science and Technology in Ghana, and a degree of Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters from the University of the Virgin Islands. At home in Barbados, Sir Hilary has been honored at the highest level. In 2007, he was awarded a Command and Knight of St. Andrew, the highest national honor of Barbados, in recognition of his distinguished service in the field of education, sports, and the arts. And to add to the prestigious award of knighthood, in 2015, Sir Hillary was honored by the Borough of Brooklyn, New York, for his extraordinary achievement, outstanding leadership, and contribution to the community. He also received in 2015 the second Global Community Healer Award for Humanitarian Work from the Commun uh, Community Healer Network, Washington, D.C. And I'm sure that this was one of Sir Hil Hillary's greatest achievements since he followed in the steps of the legendary Maya Angelou. In 2016, he received the Cicero Award of Honor from the government of Dominica in recognition of his contribution to the Commonwealth of Dominica and the region in the field of education. Recently, he received the prestigious Amistad Award from Central Connecticut State University in recognition of his outstanding contributions to historical knowledge and the struggle for human rights and social justice. Sir Hillary is also a strong proponent of service of serving the community, so it is therefore not surprising that he serves in roles in the private sector. As a long-standing director of Sagicor Financial Corporation and director of telecoms giant Cable & Wireless. Sir Hillary's passion for sports, especially cricket, is a thing of legend. It should therefore come as no surprise that he has also served as a director of the West Indies Cricket Board and was a director of West Indies Cricket World Cup, Inc. He is founder and director of the CLR James Center for Cricket Research and was the founder director of the Sajikor West Indies Cricket Academy. He is also vice president of the Commonwealth Advisory Body of Sport and Development, which advises sport ministers on the planning of the Commonwealth Games. You know, I'm, I, I'm from a medical background, and, and sir, so I'm just wondering, did you inadvertently get cloned? <laughs> Maybe there are many clones of you walking around doing all this. 
In addition to his service in the arena of sports, Sir Hilary is also chairman of the Caribbean Examination Council, chairman of the Caribbean Commission on Reparations, and he is also a member of the United Nations Development Program Advisory Panel for the Caribbean Human Development Report. With all that he has achieved, Sir Hilary has still found the time to be an accomplished playwright, with six of his staged works receiving popular acclaim. So there you have it. Sir Hilary Beckles, distinguished university administrator, internationally reputed historian, an expert thinker and a strategist in higher education. Speaking for myself, what I admire most about Sir Hilary is that he is intellectually fearless and courageous. And for those academics who dare to venture into the realm of administration, he has shown that the job of a researcher can continue even once administration comes a calling. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, it is my distinct honor to welcome to the stage our featured speaker for tonight's seventh annual George Lamming Distinguished Lecture, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. Thank you, uh, Clive, for your generosity. Uh, Comrade George and his daughter, his granddaughter, great granddaughter, tribe, family, friends of the Lamin family, caretakers of the Lamin family, and George, my colleagues, uh, friends, a very good evening, everyone. It is, it is more than an honor for me to be a part of this series of lectures in honor of George, who, as you have heard, is celebrating his four scores and ten. It is much more than a way of showing respect. Respect is too formal a word to describe how I feel about someone who I admire, have respected, and happily has become a trusted friend. What I admire most about George is his humor. <laughs> One of the jokes he gave me over 20 years ago, which I have not forgotten, and that is relevant this evening, was a story he told about the Barbadian who emigrated to England in 1953 and on arrival in England uh, discovered that there were all of these celebrations around the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II and the British people were celebrating ferociously this young queen and the Barbadian wrote home to his mother in Spikestown to say, Dear Mum, uh, you'll be happy to know that I have arrived in England safely. And guess what? They are celebrating here as well. <laughs> uh, that is very significant because it speaks to the issue of consciousness, of identity, the issues that have been at the core of George's work over 70 years. Uh, Professor Tennyson, I'm not angry. I have not been in a very long time. In fact, arguably, the last occasion I recall being very angry was when I wanted to be a professional cricketer 
and my father gave me a slap around my ears and told me go and finish my O levels and stop the nonsense. That, that was the moment. That was the moment. But this is a conversation about where George has led us these many decades and where I believe I have tried to take one of the strands of his work and move it along uh, just, just a little. Now, before I was born, George, as a teenager, had been pondering all of these questions I wish to raise this evening. So that, that puts us in a sense, of, a sense of historical time. Because at the center of all of George's work is this discourse around time, whose time, the nature of time, and, and what we can make what we can make of time. And he does not, of course, discuss time in a linear fashion, in a mechanical fashion, but in a dialectical fashion, though uh, within all of his work is this structural movement from the indigenous, the indigenous world of the Caribbean through to the colonial imposition and now the emergence of Caribbean nations. The, what I call the, the, the ballad of, of San Cristobal. Now, G, uh, a child of the chattel, writing his first major seismic impact and work about living in his castle, the castle of his skin, and dealing with time in terms of anxiety, imagining, belonging, and of course, and in from time to time, a sense, a sense of betrayal. But it's, this is not a lecture, therefore, it is in part a conversation but at the same time it's an opportunity for me to ramble all over the place but it, it doesn't matter if you ramble the critical thing is if you can find your way home and it is my intention to go on a little rambling and after I have rambled I think I have left a few pieces of paper along the way so that I could find my way home. Now, George has been very impatient with Caribbean historians in general. I believe he has celebrated our finest historians, but in general, he has been impatient with us and in many instances, disappointed in us. And his disappointment has to do with our refusal to see this Caribbean world as a united civilization uh, in search of its own destiny. And we tend to break it up into colonial dispensations so that Someone is a historian of the English islands, someone is a historian of the French islands, someone is a historian of the Spanish territories. But we, we do not study the history of this region as a whole, which would require the enormous task of comprehending archives and language, but rising to transcend all of that in order to speak seriously about the Caribbean as a united uh, community. He has been impatient with our refusal to deal with the fundamental truths of this region and not to confront those truths in a serious way uh, not with anger or any other emotion of that nature but with 
intellectual clarity and, and focus. And those of us who have adhered to his strictures have tried our best to, to be guided by his enormous spirit uh, so that this, this rambling this evening is again my efforts to be as true as I possibly can to his admonitions and to his, and to his guidance, especially in respect of the issue of managing time and identity. Let me say something about an important notion of time. In 1869, the Reverend Greville Chester visited Barbados. 1869. He was collecting insights into this world that was described as the new freedom. The, the first generation of people in the Caribbean who have entered into the freedom of post-emancipation. And he is moving among the people in the region, trying to comprehend how they are imagining this new moment in their lives. And he made an interesting observation. He says, most black people in the Caribbean do not know how old they are. Because for all of the decades and centuries they have been in the region, that sense of time, of registering a time, a moment of birth and development, those issues of time were not a part of their experience. They were recording moments like that was not a part of their. And most people, most black people then, had no idea of their age. And they had a general sense of time, he said. One, the time when our ancestors were in Africa. That was the first block of time. The second block of time, he says, was the slavery, which they called the barbarity time, which is an interesting concept. The notion of the free Africans referring to the slavery period as the barbarity time. Then the third phase of block of time they had was the time since the free paper. The time since the free, the free paper. The, and by the free paper, he meant the Emancipation Act. And the free paper, he said, free so to speak. And then he entered a conversation that it was freedom, but only on paper. And that is in itself interesting because they had a critical notion of this free paper as freedom, so to speak, on paper. Then the fourth block of time, he says, was life since the cholera, the 18. 54 outbreak of cholera, in which over 50,000 people died in a few weeks on this island. You cannot imagine 50,000 people dying in a few weeks. You can't imagine it, so don't even try to imagine it. But that is what happened, and for them, this was traumatic. And that was the notion of time. But he went on to say that a time will come when they will have another marker. A time will come when the Africans will have another marker of time. And I would wish to invite you to imagine that that marker, that new marker, we will call that independence. The moment where colonization is ended and these chattel these chattel people are now becoming citizens. So the next marker would be the movement from chattel to, to citizen. And this is what I wish to 
discuss this journey uh, through time uh, this, this evening. And to use the concept of Britain's perfect Caribbean crime, that this history, this journey, is best described as a protracted crime against humanity in which the British and the Europeans in general have walked away scot-free. The question of how citizens allow crimes to go unnoticed, unaccounted for, and unremedied speak to the nature of our time. Whether we as citizens, how we have allowed our time to be associated with the ability of Britain and Europe to commit these crimes and go away scot-free. The core of the presentation, though, will demonstrate, I will demonstrate that the reparatory justice movement in which we are involved at the moment is the seventh phase in this movement. That we, in our time, we are in the seventh wave of this movement. And I will trace all of those attempts to achieve reparatory justice for our people over 200 years through these many waves and movements. So my thesis then is that each generation of African people in the Caribbean, each generation of African people in the Caribbean from emancipation to the present time have developed a reparatory justice movement. And we are now in the seventh iteration of it. So there is nothing spectacular about our moment. It is unique in many ways, but it is the seventh phase in the development of this struggle. And the important point then is to say that we are just building on the movements of our ancestors decade by decade through the last two hundred years. The moment of conjuncture is the remarkable statement once made by George that in a way the novel, the art form he has mastered and is globally celebrated as a genius of that form and we cannot imagine how at the age of 21 or 22 he could have written in the castle of my skin. Nobody could imagine how a child can write like that. But as a child, he wrote like that. Uh, that the novel is really a form of social history. This is a remarkable statement because it is not common for lit literary specialists to consider the novel as a piece of architecture in the tradition of social history or having any connection to social history. So this grounds us as historians. This helps us to tap into the imagination of the literary specialist, uh, George in particular, in order to deepen the quality of our work. Now, how how did these prime ministers of Britain come into us in the Caribbean imagined that they could enter into our contemporary spaces and exit with a comprehensive belief that they have no case to answer? Tony Blair 
who is a frequent visitor to the Caribbean and to Barbados especially, and especially uh, when he was prime minister. And I had the pleasure of discussing history of him on two occasions. But he was first to articulate very clearly that Britain did nothing wrong, committed no crime, has nothing to apologize for, and will not apologize for slavery, the slave trade, colonization, and apartheid. Those of you who were either in Durban in 2001 or were paying close attention would know that that conversation in the UN context was framed by his policy position that Britain has to take a clear view on this matter of its relationship to African people uh, and to their own uh, crimes against humanity. Now, the question to be asked is whether in formulating his view that this would be the policy of Britain to the world, that slavery was legal at the time it was perpetrated, and that for the 300 years that Britain practiced chattel slavery in the Caribbean and elsewhere, that it did so legally and therefore did not commit a crime. And for him to go on to suggest that as a consequence of the moral outrage, the concept of an apology for that past is irrelevant. Now, we know a few things about reparatory justice. One of the things we know about it is that it is never received by a people who, though they are victims, are disorganized, unclear, uncommitted, and focus. We also know that reparatory justice is never conceded unless authority and power are challenged. We also know that the victims and their descendants are easily intimidated, and in the politics of intimidation, time rolls on. The British notion of time, which Blair articulated, is that we probably need another 40 years to get through this. That even though there are people in the Caribbean whose parents were born in slavery, and many more whose grandparents were born in slavery, and therefore slavery is very present in the imagination of many households in the Caribbean. The British argument that it was a long, long, long time ago comes into focus if Britain is able to get through this for another 40 years. Then there will be no families in this region whose parents and grandparents were born in slavery. So all Britain has to do as a strategy is to hold strain for another 40 years and they will be out of the dark part of this process. So time, again, a concept of time. Blair is also known for presiding over the conversations in the British Parliament when, as, as part of the celebration of their abolition of their slave trade in African bodies, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, having discussed slavery and slave trading, came to the conclusion that there is no crime, but even if it was possible to imagine that there was a crime, 
the crime is too large to litigate. So if you read the debates in the British House of Parliament and both the Commons and the Lords in 2007-8, both houses came to the conclusion that the enormity of the crime, the enormity of it, though they were not prepared to admit it was a crime, but conceding that it was a crime, the enormity of it would not allow for any possible form of legal discussion. There is no court that could discuss it. There is no auditing process that could account for it. And given its enormity, it is best to put it under the carpet and move on. Now, I was sitting in the gallery when that conversation was going on. And I was standing there saying, well, yes, I can imagine it. But that was the conclusion. Too large. The crime is too large to consider. Then we had David Cameron, who visited with us in the Caribbean recently. And he spoke in the Jamaican Parliament, in a House of Representatives, inhabited 90% so by the descendants of enslaved peoples in Jamaica. And he told the Jamaican Parliament and the people of Jamaica that, yes, the history was horrible, but it is time that the black people get over it. The, the, the concept of getting over it resonated through Jamaica and the Caribbean. The notion that a prime minister of the recipient nation of these crimes and Britain had made more money out of slavery than any other European nation, we know that the Portuguese were the largest shippers of African bodies. But the British, because of their superior financial and monetary skills and institutions, extracted more revenue and wealth out of it than any other nation. Uh, he himself, being a descendant of the Earl of Fife, who was one of Jamaica's largest slave owners, and he inherited this wealth from his great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, for him to enter the Jamaica Parliament and tell the people of Jamaica to get over it ha resonated with the people of the country. Prime, former Prime Minister P.J. Patterson uh, was moved emotionally to say that this statement by him represented an abuse of privilege. It was a flagrant abuse of privilege, especially against the background that before he visited the Caribbean, he had made available from the public treasury millions of dollars, of pounds, to establish a memorial so that the British people will never ever forget the Holocaust against the Jewish community. And moving from that discourse over the Atlantic to this discourse, he found a rupture in his sense, in his sense of humanity. So the past is with us every day. The past is with us every day. And prime minister after prime minister of Britain have either told us we did nothing wrong, or if we did get over it, and in any event, the history is too large to consider in any organized, in any organized fashion. Then, of course, we have our own perception of our own, of our own history. The war of terror was unleashed upon the African peoples for 500 years. The war of terror unleashed on the people of the Caribbean uh, reached its zenith. Nowhere in modern history can we document terrorism anywhere near the level that was perpetrated in the Caribbean. If there is 
a maximum category of human terror, then the Caribbean was the place that experienced that, that terror. If you imagine Sam Sharp, who mobilized the people of Jamaica, the largest slave owning community, with a speech in which he says, Today we are free, or today we die. He is being taken to the gallows, and as usual, the British had this tremendous sense of occasion and humor, in which before they would put the rope around your neck, they would ask you if you have any final words. Sam Sharp's final words were extraordinary. He said, I will not live another minute in slavery. It is freedom or it is nothing at all. So those were the last words of Sam Sharp. But right across the Caribbean, that was the norm. Thousands and thousands of African peoples march into the gallows and making final speeches. All because they imagine that what Toussaint Louverture had done in Haiti to end the reign of terror and institute humanity that they could follow. So we have to account for this mindset, for this consciousness that enable us to make these statements. Then we come to the first Caribbean discourse about reparations. 1820s, the conversation has entered finally into the British Parliament that slavery is not sustainable. The war of General Bassa in Barbados was the critical turning point in this history. Barbados had not seen a rebellion of the Africans in over a hundred years. Barbados was presented as the place where the British had broken the spirit of the African peoples. Not having a rebellion in a hundred years, the British were confident that Barbados could be used as a showpiece that the Africans were comfortable with slavery and that they had no commitment to freedom. So Barbados was the poster boy of slavery. It was the place where the British used in their public commentary that Barbados, our first colony, is stable, is secure, and slavery has a long future indeed. The Bustle Rebellion destroyed all of those perceptions and destroyed the assumption that you could deprive people of their freedom, even in the context of extreme military suppression. And so the conversation started in the aftermath of the Bustle Rebellion. If you read the parliamentary debates in the 1820s, the, the image of Barbados is haunting the British Parliament. How could we have been so wrong? How could we have imagined that we had conquered the 85,000 Africans on the island, how could we have been so wrong? If Barbados has gone up in flames, all of the other colonies will do so. Slavery has no future in its current form because the last stronghold, Barbados, has been taken. Thomas Buxton 
is the man who pushed those arguments through the British Parliament. Slavery has no future. It is not sustainable. The people of Barbados have broken ranks. Barbados have shown that slavery cannot continue and we must end it and end it now. In pushing his argument through the Parliament, Buxton argued that the Africans should be compensated because the British Parliament, made up of slave owners, had finally reached the stage after 10 years of debate in which they were ready to concede, okay, okay, okay. We cannot hold it much longer unless we send more soldiers. Unless we militarize each island, we cannot hold the Africans in slavery any longer. But if we are going to give up slavery, we have to be given reparations for it. Buxton was placed in a predicament because for him, the slave owners were criminals and he called them criminals. In his parliamentary speeches, he referred to the slave owners as criminals and when the slave owners argued for reparations, he said, can you imagine that these people who are the greatest criminals in our nation now wish to be compensated for their crimes. But he eventually was forced to compromise. He was caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. If he wanted to see the legislation pass, if he wanted to see the Africans freed, then he had to agree to give the criminals compensation. And he was caught in that very difficult situation. He knew he was committing a deep psychological and moral offense. In fact, he said that this is a breach of my own morality just to agree in a parliament to compensate slave owners, to repair slave owners for the crimes they have committed against the African peoples. He says the Africans are the ones who must receive the reparations. And he pushed very hard. Of course, there were they were surrounded by researchers in the Caribbean who were sending them information. And information was coming from the Caribbean by persons who were enslaved, by persons who were formerly enslaved and now free, demanding reparations for the years of their enslavement. So he was in possession of the information coming out of the Caribbean from the black community, slave and free, enslaved and free, demanding reparations from the British Parliament as a critical part of the legislation. There was a moment when he was hopeful. There was a moment when he was hopeful that the argument could have found its way through the Parliament to pay reparations to the enslaved Africans. There was a moment when he was hopeful. But, not surprisingly, the slave owners of Barbados were the ones who fought most aggressively against him on this question because the position of the Barbados Assembly and the Barbados slave owners that under no circumstances will they agree to any form of emancipation on this island. So Buxton versus Barbados became the dialogue in the British Parliament. And for five years, Buxton ran a quarrel in the British House of Commons with the Barbadian slave owners. It was actually called Buxton versus Barbados, and it was the center of the debate in the 1820s how to deal with the Barbadian slave owners and the, the war against Buxton. Of course, they used to burn effigies of Buxton in Bridgetown. The, they would, you know, make these effigies of him and burn him in Bridgetown so he was seen as, as the great evil, the great evil that uh, sat in the British Parliament. So he made this case. He said, we want an Emancipation Act that has built into it reparations for the Africans. In the first sitting of the House, that was taken out. That was 
de ejected from the conversation. And what took center stage was reparations for the slave owners. And we know how that went. Now, where the work now starts, how does the work now begin? Faked emancipation. The parliament has now agreed that we are going to free the Africans. We now have to craft a bill that can get through both houses of the parliament. And you must remember that the majority of the members in the lower house and the upper house are slave owners. Most of them had slave trading business or slavery, so this is a slave owning parliament in both houses that now has to agree to a bill of emancipation. How then do we structure this bill? That bill that eventually was passed was the greatest piece of legal racism passed in the history of the British Parliament. And that is not hyperbole, I will explain why. It was the most racist act passed in the British Parliament. In the 300 years of the British Parliament, the act of emancipation was the greatest piece of racist architecture. Let me explain what I mean by this. The first thing they had to do, which is to compensate the slave owners for the loss of their property. In order to achieve that, the British Parliament had, first of all, to legislate that the Africans were property. I hope you follow this. this. This is very important that we follow this closely. Because what the parliament is going to do is to instruct the treasury to take taxpayers' money and pay slave owners property compensation. You can only pay property compensation if the thing that is being taken away is property. Now, for 200 years, the British Parliament had been fudging the issue. Lawyers had been asking the question all these years. Are Africans property? Are they real estate? Are they property? We know that in the colonies, the colonial government had legislated that the Africans were not humans, they were property, they were real estate, they were chattel. That was the colonial assemblies. But the British Parliament had always said that we have never defined the Africans as property. That is their practice in the colonies, but not in the British Parliament. But in order now to pay property compensation, for the first time in 300 years, the British Parliament legislated, yes, black people are property. They are not human beings, they are chattel and they are real estate. And that became the first principle of the Emancipation Act. Now, imagine then an act of emancipation that begins on the premise that the people who are being emancipated are property. Now, this, isn't, this is projected as an act of humanity. This is an act of Christian charity. This is an act of philanthropy. This is an act that shows British morality that begins with the denial of people of their human identity. So the very Emancipation Act showed that the British government had committed a crime against humanity by denying people their human identity. So the very act of emancipation is the British parliamentary declaration that African peoples are not human beings. That is important. Then, it proceeded to place a value on the Africans, the 800,000 Africans they had across the region. They sent down their accountants. They went through plantation by plantation. The governments were asked to put a value on all the slaves. And they came up with this calculation, which they agreed upon, that the Africans in the Caribbean the market value was 48 million pounds. So, the British Parliament is now treating with 48 million pounds of assets. And the state is taking away this 48 million pounds from the citizens and 
freeing the property. The compensation must begin. How are we going to find the money to pay these slave owners this 48 million pounds? The first thing the British government did was to say, we don't have enough money in the treasury to pay the 48 million. So we are going to raise a bond, and they floated a public bond. They floated a public bond to raise some of the money. And the Rothschild, the Rothschild Corporation, uh, the Jewish company, the Rothschilds, they bought the bond and put up 20 million pounds. So now the British government has 20 million pounds, and they have said, we're not going to pay any more than 20 million. But the property is worth 48 million, but we're going to pay 20. How are we going to craft an act of parliament to pay 20 million in cash, but now we have this other 28 million to account for? This is where the technicians in the parliament go to work. And I should tell you, if you really want to understand what a government is all about, don't listen to the speeches in parliament. The speeches in Parliament is just for the gallery. Read the minutes of the subcommittees. The subcommittees that are set up to go and work through the details and come back to the Parliament. That is where the work is done. And so the subcommittee came up with a strategy. We're going to pay 20 million in cash, which we have from the bond, but we're going to create something called the apprenticeship. After the Africans are free, they are going to work for another eight years for free. So they're going to pass a bill designed in such a way that they have to work for eight years after they are free for their owners and work off the 28 million. So eventually they calculated that they could get the Africans to work it off in four years. So the act was passed. You are free, but you must work for free for your existing owners for four years. And in the four years of free labor, the Africans will work off the $28 million pounds uh, left outstanding. That was the act of emancipation crafted by this parliament. Brilliant piece of legislation from their perspective. Genius. Now. The four years of working for free after you are free meant that the Africans paid the majority of the money. So this act of emancipation, the Africans had to pay for their freedom. They paid more for their freedom than what the British paid. Yet this parliament was home to speeches of moral certitude and moral outpour of, look what we have done for modernity. We have shown the world the light. That's a language in the parliament. But the Africans, our ancestors, paid more for our freedom than this parliament. And that is the fundamental point of the racist nature of this Emancipation Act. But there was another dimension to it which we have to study. The Emancipation Act made it very clear that these Africans who are now freed must never enjoy freedom in a real sense. The act is designed to protect the plantations, to make sure that the land stays in the hands of the plantation owners, that the blacks remain landless, that they remain proletarian, they do not become the owners of land and assets. So the act was designed to divorce the free people from land. Because land is the basis of freedom and liberty. So to make sure that they did not get land, the act made it very clear that these people must return to work as laborers on the day of the emancipation. One day holiday, go back to work the next day, no land, no assets. And let's talk about that. The great conversation 
how to craft an act of emancipation that does not allow emancipation. Thomas Carlyle and John Stuart Mill, arguably, in the British context, two of their finest philosophers. And both of them are deeply involved in this emancipation discourse. Deeply involved. The philosophers are talking about this freedom thing, this emancipation thing. It's a big discourse of philosophy in Britain. These two gentlemen squared off. John Stuart Mill, known in British philosophy as a progressive thinker. He said, the emancipation of the Africans must be accompanied by landed enfranchisement so they could root their freedom in land and assets to build for the future. John Stuart Mill was consistently supportive of black economic enfranchisement as the way forward. Thomas Carlyle wrote a famous article in response to John Stuart Mill's. And he called his article, the famous article, 1848, on the nigger question. The article by Thomas Carlyle, highly respected philosopher, on the nigger question, he argued as follows. The British have made a fundamental error in the Emancipation Act. Africans, he argued, are children, they are childlike, they are just a step removed from animals, and they require our long-term tutelage on the slavery. And another hundred years of slavery, we will bring them up to humanity. But this act is a fundamental error, big mistake. The Africans, he says, in the Caribbean will descend into darkness and barbarism. They will lie around on the coconut trees eating pumpkins all day. They will not work. They will not look after their children. They will not build families because they do not know how. Emancipation is an error. And he wrote the nigger question. John Stuart Mill responded to him and he wrote a rebuttal on the nigger question part two. And these essays were published in the Edinburgh Review, highly respected academic journal. This conversation went on. Carlyle argued in the end that so long as we keep them removed from land, we can keep them in a slave-like situation for another century. And Carlyle carried the day. Carlyle carried the day as the most influential philosopher on the emancipation legislation and all of the laws that were passed in the decade after emancipation to make sure that the Africans remain attached to the plantations without land and in a slave-like condition for the future. Carlyle was the most influential philosopher in the parliamentary context. So to understand the Emancipation Act and what happened thereafter, you must follow Carlyle's philosophy because he was the man who shaped the context of this, of this legislation. 20 years later, 20 years after Carlyle published on the nigger question, Paul Bogle challenges that assumption of emancipation. The British Parliament said, we are going to pass a series of laws to ensure that we use taxation to prevent former slaves from getting land. So each assembly was told to place a tax on the purchase of land that is so high as to prevent any black person from purchasing land. And each parliament, especially the Jamaican parliament, passed a series of laws using taxation to prevent black people from becoming free through the ownership of land. Paul Bogle was the leader of the 1865 movement that challenged that. He told his people in Jamaica, 300,000 of us have been free. We have no land. We are still in slavery. The land is here, it's crown land. It is owned by the crown. It is not being used. 
It's abandoned, but the government have forbid us having access to it. He instructed his people, occupy the land, take possession of the land, and we will fight for the land. And that is what Paul Bogle did. The Jamaican people move onto the land, turn it into peasant production, small farms, and they occupy thousands and thousands of acres and land, and Jamaicans began to build up themselves as a free people. The British government realizing what was happening in Jamaica, another conversation started. Jamaica is being Haitianized because they look across the bay and here is Haiti, a land where the African people had fought, had won, and had turned the plantations into small farms. Peasants are everywhere. Jamaica is being Haitianized and the British government sent instructions down to Jamaica to drive the blacks off the land. The governor sent the troops. The troops forced the Africans off the land. The war started and the troops massacred 500 people in a few days and took possession of the land and they put a rope around the neck of Paul Bogle. Now, after Paul Bogle was taken to the gallows and executed, another major debate started in Britain about the murder of Paul Bogle. Baptist priest, brilliant young intellectual, smart man, great leader, but he saw the solution to emancipation. Emancipation as structured by the British was not sustainable. The occupation of the land was the emancipation and of course he was executed for this. And the British intellectuals of the left came to his defense. Karl Marx was one of the first intellectuals to make the comment about the butchery of black people in Jamaica and accused the British government of committing high crime in the murder of Jamaican people moving to possess land. Karl Marx became one of the first intellectuals to speak and to write about the strategy of the African peoples to emancipate themselves through the acquisition of land. And he defended the actions of Paul Bogle and his colleagues. This is very significant because that experience at Moran Bay, that 500 massacre, led Marx to dig deeper into understanding the true nature of imperialism and colonization and its impact upon the African peoples. And then Marx began to write very supportive of the black liberation struggles in his, some of his early works on colonization. But it was largely a reaction to what Paul Bogle had done and what had happened uh, to him. But we did not have to rely entirely on Marx, on John Stuart Mill. Emerging out of emancipation was that first crop of black intellectuals speaking to these matters. And one of the first young intellectuals of the emancipation era was J.J. Thomas. He was only a few years old, a child, when the Emancipation Act was passed in Trinidad. But as a teenager, his intellectual prowess was well known. And towards the end, we have uh, Froud. Professor J.A. Froud, a brilliant right-wing British intellectual, well-known historian. He comes to the Caribbean. He says, I want to see for myself what is happening to these black people in the Caribbean? Are they free or are they not free? I want to see for myself. He comes to the Caribbean and he goes on a tour. He goes back to England and he writes a book called The English in the West Indies. This book became a bestseller. And he argued, 40 years have gone by, 40 years have gone by, and there is absolutely no doubt that we the British have made a fundamental error. Emancipation was the wrong thing to have done. 
It has led to the degeneration of the African peoples. They are now without the tutelage of the Europeans. They are looking to Africa for inspiration. They are looking to their own barbaric culture for identity. We have made an error. We need to go back in and restore slavery. We need to go back in and restore slavery to, in order to save the Caribbean. J.J. Thomas wrote his second major book. And he called his book Fraudacity. <laughs> that Professor Fraud had the audacity to come to the Caribbean and see African peoples trying to emancipate themselves, paying a great human price for it, dying in their thousands. And I want you to remember, more Africans were killed in the 50 years after emancipation. In the 50 years after emancipation, more Africans were killed by the British government than in the 50 years of slavery. The last 50 years of slavery produced a number of revolts. The Bustle Revolt, the Samshat Revolt, there were many revolts in the last 50 years. But in the 50 years after emancipation, more Africans were slaughtered by the British governments and its colonial armies than in the 50 years of, of slavery. And so, J.J. Thomas, knowing this to be true, wrote his book. He's a young man in his 30s, self-educated, a man of letters, very much a George Lamon of his time, very much a George Lamon of his time, young, brilliant, clear-minded, and he writes a book called Fraudacity, The West Indian Fables by J. Anthony Fraud. And he devastated Professor Fraud. I should tell you that when Fraudacity was published in 1889, it became an automatic bestseller in Britain because the British public could not understand how a child out of slavery could take on intellectually their leading philosopher and historian and discredit his work with such linguistic ease. J.J. was invited to England, he went to England, he gave a series of public lectures, he went on tour, he went to France, he was invited into high society, he was a brilliant mind, the first major black intellectual to stand up for his people, J.J., born just two years after slavery. Now, he makes the case for reparations. J.J. says, this crime this crime and this wound will only be healed when there is just compensation for the people of Africa. And he argued that, not only in this book, but in a series of other books, he argued for the just compensation of the African people for the 300 years of slavery. So this becomes the third movement of the reparations discourse. The third movement. And this time, it is led by a descendant of the enslaved, writing, lecturing, speaking for reparatory justice and standing up against the powers of the European traditions. Then comes the first, the first British admission that reparation was due. The end of the 19th century, the 1880s especially, there is famine across the Caribbean. There is famine. The second generation of free black people without freedom are dying of hunger and famine because they are landless. The price of food escalating. And in all of these islands, especially Barbados, there is widespread famine. I'm not referring to hunger. Hunger was the norm. I'm speaking about famine. The famine on this island was so intense that there was an epidemic of people eating rats, eating frogs, in order to survive. And the, the men would go into the cane fields, they would rattle the cane fields, the rats would run through the canes, and the women would be at the end of the cane with the basket catching the rats. And those were survival strategies because the plantations took all of the land 
and the 2% of the white community own 90% of the land while the people on this island were starving. The starvation and the hunger and the famine went right across this region. It became such a scandal that the British government finally sent a royal commission down to the Caribbean. And they sent a royal commission, the first royal commission to look at the condition of black people since emancipation. The first commission sent out by the British government 50 years after emancipation go and report on the true state of the black people. The commission is a remarkable document. The commissioners admitted that the famine in the Caribbean due to landlessness must be alleviated through a massive process of land reform and recommended in its findings that only a significant transfer of land to the black community can solve the problem of famine in the black community, especially among the women and children. This recommendation uh, led a critic to refer to that as the Magna Charta of the black people of the Caribbean. It is a remarkable document. Very well detailed, they went to every island across the Caribbean in the British Empire, collected and reported and recommended land transfer. We have to take 30 or 40 percent of the plantations. We have to break them up and transfer the plantations to the people. Otherwise, these Africans will continue to starve to death 50 years, 60 years, 70 years after emancipation. It was a remarkable re re recommendation. What became of it? Joseph Chamberlain was Secretary of State in the British government. The commission report went to him and he accepted the integrity of the report. But in his speech to the British Parliament, he said, yes, we are accepting the recommendation of this commission that massive land transfer to the black community is necessary for emancipation, but the transfer must not take place at the expense of the white planter community of the islands. Therein lies the contradiction. In other words, as Secretary of State, he is saying, the monopoly of the land by the white community must not be tampered with. But if you can find some rab land, well, give it to the Africans. But do not trouble the issue of white monopoly domination of the land because that is necessary for the British presence in the Caribbean. And in a stroke, that commission report was made a dead letter by Joseph Chamberlain, the Secretary of State. That would have been the first bold attempt in order to create land for the African peoples. And the remarkable thing is that this report was influenced by the report that was carried out in the American Assembly and the American Congress at their emancipation, which was to 40 acres and a mule. The Americans pushing through their Emancipation Act have said, OK, we can't just free the African people. We have to give them land. And thus, the policy of 40 acres and the mule, that each enslaved person will get land as the basis of their genuine emancipation. This was a feeble attempt by the British government to copy the Americans, but then they, they pulled back. Leaving no choice for the emergence of Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey then, in the aftermath of the rejection of that report, Marcus Garvey emerged as the revolutionary leader of the black people of the Caribbean demanding economic empowerment. But note that Garvey is at his, at his height, a hundred years after emancipation. A full century of emancipation, Garvey emerges as the man pushing for the emancipation, the real emancipation, not the fake emancipation, the real emancipation of the African peoples. And there's a very interesting description of Marcus Garvey speaking 
in Queen's Park here in Barbados. And the, the, cane, the cane workers of St. Andrew and St. Lucy and St. Peter and St. George uh, go into Queen's Park to hear Marcus Garvey. And walking through Bridgetown, Broad Street, with their cutlasses. Now, imagine the psychological effect of that. All of the businesses on Broad Street were closed and shut down because hundreds of cane cutters walking through Broad Street with machetes in their hands going to hear Marcus Messiah Garvey in Queen's Park. Because they knew that his message coming a hundred years after emancipation was the voice of emancipation. Then came the fourth, the fourth discourse on reparations. After all the rebellions of the 30s, Clement Paine in Barbados, all the revolts that spread right through the Caribbean in the 1930s, the African peoples are celebrating 100 years of freedom, and they're celebrating 100 years of freedom with revolution. We'll not accept any more of this. The rebellions are developing from St. Kitts through to Barbados, to Trinidad, to Jamaica, right through the Caribbean. The workers are rising up, celebrating the centenary of emancipation. How do you celebrate the centenary of a major event with violence? Unless you believe that the hundred years has been a war of terror upon you. And that clearly was the perception that happened in the 1930s. The British government once again sent down another commission. They assembled a commission to go to the Caribbean to see what can we do to empower these black people who have gone up in arms against us. The Moyne Commission came down. Brilliant report again. They went through the region island by island. They studied the poverty, the hunger, the malnutrition, the infant mortality, the squalor. They did a major demographic and forensic study of the African peoples. And in the Moyne report, Lord Moyne, in his introductory statements, made the point that the Caribbean is a disgrace to the British name. It's a disgrace that we have freed these people, a hundred years have gone by, and the state in which they now live is deplorable. It is absolutely deplorable, and they went through that conversation to say something must be done to empower these people with resources, with your land, so that they can experience emancipation in a fundamental way. When that report was submitted to the British Parliament in 1939, it did not see light of day for five years. The Moyne report did not see light of day for five years. The British government suppressed that report. They suppressed it largely because the war, the Second World War was going on and black people from the Caribbean were going to England to fight for the British. And this report, which was an embarrassment to them, but yet here are these young men from the Caribbean leaving in their thousands to go to England, to Europe, to fight against Hitler. You know, when I was a child growing up in St. Andrew, in my village, there was a, a man whose nickname was Hitler. And, well, as children, we, we didn't understand that, but later in life, I... I asked my grandfather, why, why do they call this man Hitler? And apparently, there were large numbers of young men in the village who came to Bridgetown to sign up to go and fight against Hitler. And this man stood in the village and called them jackasses. Why are you all going to shed your blood to fight against Hitler. The Germans did not enslave us. It's the British who enslaved us. Why are you guys going to fight for the people who enslave us? The Germans didn't enslave us. You guys should go and fight for the Germans. That was the conversation. And so the people in the village called him Hitler. And that name stuck with him for the rest of his life. But the point is that there was a perception as to why the Moyne report should be suppressed. And it was suppressed. But in the end, it was published. And what did it say? It said, we are not going to repeat 
the recommendations of the 1897 report, which called for economic empowerment. But instead, we are going to call for social empowerment. We're going to demand better housing, better education, better health care. They, they need a university. All of these things. They said we will give them social empowerment. But we are, we are retreating from the earlier report that called for economic empowerment through land. We are not going there. No land. But you can have an education. You can have better housing, better health care. But no economic empowerment. And that was the power of the Moyne report. But guess what? Again, the black people knew that there could be no future without enfranchisement and reparations. I would invite each of you to remember this great man as a youth. We all know Sir Arthur Lewis, Nobel laureate, first vice chancellor of our University of the West Indies, legend of economics and Caribbean empowerment. The world recognized him as one of the finest economists of all times. He was the man who won a Nobel Prize for illustrating how colonial societies, plantation societies, can be transformed to become modern industrial nations. He was the one who developed the economic principles to show how poor third world countries can become rich industrial countries. He provided the economics to show that. So, legend intellectual. But people have forgotten that when he was a very young man, in his early 30s, he wrote a little book called Labor in the West Indies. And this was published in 1939. 1939, the same year as the Moyne Report. Young Arthur Lewis. And in that little book, he says, and I quote, the issue of 200 years of unpaid slave labor the issue of 200 years of unpaid slave labor is yet to be addressed and must be addressed. We do not associate Arthur Lewis with reparations. But when he wrote in 1939, looking back that those 200 years of unpaid labor, and he's an economist, must be accounted for in any discussion of the future of the Caribbean, that statement was very powerful indeed. I have not heard any economists, I have not heard any economists in the last 30 years connect Arthur Lewis's work to that important point of principle. He's not known for that, but I invite you to investigate that yourself. Then we come to this modern era of trying to assemble these islands into a federation so that we can put them together. The great leaders. British said, okay, you, we, we are going to federate you. You cannot survive on your own. There is poverty and hunger and famine across the islands. But if we, if we bundle you together into one, we can, you could work together, maybe you can help yourselves. So help yourselves. We will work with you to federate you. We will create a framework through which you can federate yourselves. 1948, met in Montego Bay, federations on the agenda. British government said, yes, we endorse your attempt to federate. In the next 10 years, the question was being asked, OK, Britain, you have to fund the economic strategy for this federation. How are we going to federate politically if there are no resources to manage an integrated economy? How are we going to do this? You say we must federate. Yes, we are federating, but let us discuss a capital plan. Let us discuss an economic strategy. All of them made the argument. The Federation is viable and can work, and we will make it work, but it needs 
an economic strategy. It needs the foundation rooted in a development plan to bring these islands together. And I want you to remember that this is all taking place at precisely the same time that Britain has demanded a post-war reconstruction for Europe after the Second World War and persuading the Americans to roll out a Marshall Plan. The American government rolled out a Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe, to rebuild the case of Europe and put Europe back on a strong industrial footing. So while Britain is benefiting from this massive injection of development funding, the Caribbean islands are asking Britain to make a small contribution to the economics of federation. In the end, Britain pulled away. And there is no doubt, Britain pulled away. The federation began to crumble. It could not survive without a capital plan. Could not survive without the development plan. No matter how brilliant these politicians were, and we have to work on the assumptions that they all started out with integrity. But when the issue of funding came up, all the cracks, all the divisions began to occur. Britain refused to work with the Caribbean Federation to make it viable. And in the end, in the end I totally agree with A.N.R. Robinson, the late Prime Minister of Trinidad, who said we were, the rug was pulled from under us. The moment Britain refused to put fund in place to help this Caribbean economy to get off its ground, the Federation was doomed. Could not work. Britain pulled the rug, leading him to conclude there was something sinister about what Britain had done. If you give them an independence without funding, without capital, without development, without proper structures for finance and revenue, then they can become even more, they can become even more dependent when they become independent. And that was precisely the model of independence. How to make these islands more dependent when they became independent. It was emancipation part two. It was the Emancipation Plan Part 2, duped again by the British, led down the wrong path. 1948-49 is a very famous report called the Standing Close Association Report. This came out of the Montego Bay Conference. And in this report, the leaders of the Caribbean are on their knees begging Britain for a development grant to construct a federation and to launch these islands into an independent independence. Britain pulled the rug and told them, okay, well, go and have your independence. And built into that independence was a deepening of dependence on Britain. No Marshall Plan, Barrow's famous statement, time to stop loitering on colonial premises. Go away. Go away. We are now getting ready to go into the European Union. Go away. Now, what did our prime ministers do? All of them feeling in their hearts, betrayed by Britain, developed all of the national bravado of pushing for the independence agenda. Against the background of the collapse of the Federation, they all developed the euphoria of becoming the first Prime Minister and all of that rhetoric of building the nation, but they knew that in the midst of all of that, they were going to become more dependent upon Britain. And the question has always been asked, what choice was there? What is important about that moment though, is that no country, no island, no territory, place the issue of independence to a referendum. 
And it's important for us to ask why. If you're going to take a people into something as bold as independence, without a referendum, but when you speak to all of the premiers at the time, and the leading politicians at the time, they were all very fearful. They were fearful that if the issue of independence was placed as a referendum item to the people, that the majority of the people would have voted to stay colonial. And they could not take the risk. Push through the independence. It's part of your manifesto. You won an election. Push it through. And we're independent. Who don't like it can lump it. We are going forward. No referendum. Now imagine the reparations arguments today. Most people believe today, quite rightly so, that reparations will probably never happen in our lifetimes. So roll back the dice. How many Africans in 1820, how many Africans in 1820 could have imagined that they will see freedom in their lifetime. They have been enslaved for 300 years. If you have been enslaved for 300 years, how do you imagine that you will see freedom in your lifetime? They couldn't imagine it, but it happened. A series of events and processes and time, the issue we spoke about earlier, the issue of time, how time moves. And yes, they did see it. How many people could have imagined that we could become independent nations in 1930 when all the mayhem was being launched by the British government, the terror against the people of the Caribbean. How could the people have imagined that they would become independent? They couldn't imagine it. Now, you cannot imagine reparations either for the same reason. But time is going to move very quickly. It, it always done. So, what do we have now? The first Jamaican Prime Minister born after independence. All the other Prime Ministers born in the colonial period. A special breed. If you're born in the colonial, then you become independent. The consciousness of a Prime Minister who is born in a colonial time and then transition into independence has to be fundamentally different from the generation now that is born in independence. He's born in independence. Never experienced colonization. Never experienced it. Never had to sing God Save This Queen in primary school. Never had to sing it in primary school. Born in the post-independence era. And what did he do a month ago? Most remarkable. Most remarkable. 1963, the Bustamante government, one year, one year into independence, unleashed the police and the army upon the Rastafarian community and, and literally massacred people. Reference, with references were made to Rastafarian people and citizens as less than human. In one documentation, there was a reference to Rastafari as dogs. Massacre. What did he do? This is now 50 years later. He becomes the prime minister. He offers an apology. He offers an apology to the Rastafarian people of Jamaica and said the government of Jamaica will pay reparations to the Rastafari. Why? It's a different mental construct. But the young prime minister said on the Mona campus, I am a supporter of reparations from the British. But before we press our claim, we have to clean up our own house. And the government of Jamaica committed a crime against the Rastafari people, and for that we apologize, and we will pay reparations. I commended him on the Mona campus for that historic step. The ball is starting, is starting to move. 
the ball is starting to move. Our six reparations claim. Rastafari have been demanding reparations from the very beginning. From the very beginning. The Rastafari, for almost 100 years now, almost 100 years, have been demanding that there are stolen people and stolen people have a right to be returned from where they were stolen. They are stolen people. And the Rastafari have carried that position through their relationship to Haile Selassie for almost now 100 years. Our sixth phase in the development of this motion. And finally, this is where we are. Finally, this is where we are. CARICOM has established a reparations commission. We now have national reparations commissions across the region. We have, CARICOM has written to the governments of Europe calling for a summit to discuss these crimes against humanity and calling for justice. Those letters have been written to the governments of Europe calling for a summit. We could not have imagined that 20 years ago. We couldn't have imagined it 50 years ago, but now it has happened. Where do we go? Where do we go from here? The cases have to be reopened. The case of the genocide against the native people of the Caribbean. The case of that fake emancipation has to be reopened. And this independence, this independence, this insincere independence designed to foster greater dependence, these cases must be reopened. And why? Because the children of the nation state, the younger generation, are asking for accountability. And let me tell you why. This is how I wish you, this is how I wish you to remember the insincere independence. I want you to imagine a woman who has been married to a tyrant for 30, 40 years. And this tyrannical husband has been brutalizing her all through the marriage. Physical, verbal abuse day by day by day. Each time she rises up for justice, she is physically brutalized and put back into her place. And then one day, she finds the courage to free herself of that tyrant. And she picks up her children and she goes in flight from the tyrant. She's celebrating her freedom. She is celebrating her independence. Finally, free at last. But while she took her children in flight from the tyrant, she has also disconnected from the assets that were jointly accumulated with the tyrant. And so in celebrating her freedom and her independence, she have consigned her children to poverty. Because not only did she need to be free of that tyrant, she also needed a good lawyer to make sure she got her share of the resources for her children. And that is how the independence negotiations took place. Our prime ministers all signed those documents. They all signed them. Mr. Barrow, Mr. Bustamante, Eric Williams, Forrest Burnham, they all signed those documents free at last. But not one of them, not one of them in those independent discussions asked for our share of the resources that for 300 years we had accumulated and we had a right to for our children. Not one of them did that. Not one of them did that. But now, all of them have consigned their children to poverty. And now we see poverty is on the increase. We are now 50, 60 years into independence. Poverty is in the increase. And why? This is why. We are because what we have been doing and our noble efforts at nation building, 
our heroic efforts of building nations out of colonies, building societies out of the chaos of colonization, ending the terror of colonization and building freedom, what we have been doing is cleaning up the colonial mess that we inherited. That's what we've been doing. We have been cleaning up the mess. Jamaica became independent in 1962. 80% of the black people of Jamaica could not read or write in 1962. So our largest society becomes independent with three quarters of its citizens cannot read or write and they must go forward and build a modern nation with mass illiteracy. What would any government do? All of our governments have been spending heavily on housing, on health, on education. Why? What our governments have been doing is cleaning up the mess that they've inherited. The slums, the ghettos, the illiteracy, the ill health, the chronic diseases. And what has now happened is that the enormity of this cleanup operation is overwhelming each island one by the other. The enormity of it. The enormity of the mess is overwhelming them one after the other. The reparations movement is saying to Britain and to all the countries of Europe, you must come back and participate, participate in a process of development, of development cooperation that should have been built into the independence discourse. Come back and participate and cleaning up this mess you have left behind in the Caribbean. It can only be cleaned up in the context of that kind of cooperation. Now, when Prime Minister Cameron visited Jamaica last year, and the reparations movements welcomed him gloriously to the Caribbean, the land of his ancestors, and called upon him to discuss reparatory justice, he made a statement. He said, well, when I get back to Britain, I will send some money back to the Caribbean. You cannot call it reparations. If you don't wish to call it aid, you do not have to call it aid. And Prime Minister Cameron honored his word. 350 million pounds were sent out by the Prime Minister to the CDB because we in the reparations movement had demanded that Britain return to a development relation to this region. He apologized and said, I apologize for the fact that I am the first Prime Minister of Britain in 40 years, in 40 years to come to the Caribbean, the place that had made Britain great in the first place. And he sent the 350 million. It is now being utilized by the various countries. But it's only the beginning. It is only the beginning, the 350 million pounds. We don't even want to discuss that. That cannot even buy the stamp to put on the letter. We are looking at a certain kind of history. And we are saying, that we have to reopen the negotiation because when that woman picked up her children and went in flight from that tyrant, she was under so much duress and strain and stress that she needed time and her children needed time. And now those children have now grown up and those children are saying, what you did to my mother, you will not do to me. I want my share of my mother's assets. And that is what reparations is about right now. The younger generation are saying that what you did to our mother, we now need to discuss with you our share of the resources that we had accumulated collectively and jointly as a family. That is what the reparations is all about. So, the conversation is now beginning. We are now in the seventh stage, the seventh iteration of this reparations movement. And since it is true 
that every generation in the Caribbean since emancipation has launched a reparation discourse. The seventh and the eighth and the ninth will continue until we get where we need to get reparatory justice for the crimes that have been committed because we are a people with self-respect and not to hold people accountable for crimes committed against you is to diminish yourself in terms of your self-respect. And this is where we are, and I thank you for the generosity of your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.